Um, welcome everybody to today's um, IAMP One World Mathematical Physics Seminar. It's uh, a great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Stefan Teufel from uh, Tübingen. And Stefan will tell us about a slightly different look at the bulk catch correspondence in quantum hole systems. So Stefan, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks a lot, Marcello, for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers. It's really, really a pleasure to, to speak in this seminar. And thanks to the yeah, to all of you for, for uh, dropping in and for, for listening to my uh, presentation. I really appreciate this. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, based on, I mean, these are, it will include several different aspects of the problem, different works. And the, my collaborators on these works are Hovia Kornian, Joscha Henhaik, Jonas Lampert, Massimo Moscolari, and Tom Wessel. So let me start by, ah, sorry, by giving a, a quick plan of the talk so you know what, what to expect and you don't get too impatient. <laughs> If I start uh, slowly, I will start by a very quick introduction and in the basic question I will address bulk edge correspondence in quantum hall systems, but this will be very short and only heuristic. And um, then I will slowly explain what I called a slightly different look or view on this on this problem, a slightly different approach, at least at least in our understanding, different from the usual approaches to proving bulk edge correspondence. I will start by discussing very briefly classical systems, then in some more detail, the Landau Hamiltonian, so non-interacting quantum particles uh, in a constant magnetic field, where everything can be done very explicitly. And then a new result, which is a generalization of the results for the Landau Hamiltonian to ergodic random Schrodinger operators. And then actually, I will also present a result for interacting lattice fermions, which is based on the same strategy of proof. And um, where I think, yeah, which is, a, which is maybe one way to attack this problem for interacting systems um, beyond weak interactions. Okay, and I conclude with an outlook. Okay, so what is, uh, this is basically a slide for people who don't know what the bulk uh, edge correspondence in quantum whole systems is. So just a pictorial. So we will be interested in, um, in a two-dimensional electron gas. So here confined to two-dimensional strip. This is often also called a hall bar. So this here is uh, supposed to be a two-dimensional strip where the electrons are, yeah, are confined to in a magnetic, strong magnetic field perpendicular to this, uh, to this uh, plane or to this strip. And um, what, one exp what happens in equilibrium, so if the system is in thermal equilibrium, then uh, it turns out that there are still, also, although the system is in equilibrium, there are currents flowing along the boundaries, but um, the, the currents are of equal size, but opposite direction, so there's no net current flowing through the whole bar. If you now add a transversal electric field or put a transversal voltage along the whole bar, so transversal to B and transversal to the, uh, yeah, to the strip, then um, two things happen. Um, first of all, a potential gradient in the bulk, in the interior of the, uh, of the strip, away from the boundaries, will um, produce local hole currents in the bulk. And um, the uh, change of the chemical potential at the edges might lead to changes of the density at the edges, which also influence the strength of the edge current. So there might be also uh, induced an imbalance of edge currents so that the, this imbalance also contributes to the total hole current. So that's the heuristic, heuristic picture. And if one wants to explain the quantum Hall effect, the fact that at very low temperatures and certain magnetic fields, the uh, response, this, the, the transport coefficient, so the, the whole conductance of such a whole bar is uh, quantized, um, uh, this explanation in particular requires that the, the uh, response coefficient in the bulk and the response coefficient at the edge are equal. So sigma infinity is denotes the, um, the whole conductivity 
in the bulk. And by infinity, I will usually uh, denote quantities which are defined in terms of a bulk system that has no boundaries. So in the following infinity will only me always mean the system without boundaries and E will mean the system with edges. And I will also put edge quantities in green so you don't lose uh, track of what belongs where. So, and this is the question I would like to talk about eventually how to understand the equality of these transport coefficients in such quantum Hall systems. Okay, that's just a heuristic introduction. And now let me, just to put things into context, say a few more things about this uh, quantum Hall effect. So you have heard, probably all heard about it, uh, of course. There has been a lot of uh, work in, in, uh, in mathematical physics concerning the question of what happens in the bulk, the bulk hole conductivity. And uh, the quantization of that can be understood in terms of the topology of the so-called Bloch bundle. So the, it turns out that in periodic systems, the, uh, the hole conductivity at zero temperature at certain magnetic fields is the churn number of a certain vector bundle and thus an integer. In particular, this was observed by, by Thaulis and co-workers and earned him the Nobel Prize in 2016. And let me actually not, uh, not go through all of these works. It will take too much time. Maybe I should emphasize uh, Billy Saar and, and Hermann Schulz-Baldes. They basically generalized this view to, to uh, random ergodic systems. Um, and uh, more recently, there have been uh, works, uh, Hastings, Michalakis, and Bachmann, Wolstorak, Fraas, where they proved the quantization of the bulk Hall conductivity for certain models of interacting fermions. Okay, so that's the bulk picture, but this is not the topic I'm talking about. That's why I'm quick on the references. The edge picture, um, so there, one thing you find in physics textbook is the idea that uh, the edge states come from Landau levels, which bend. So in the, in the bulk, you have Landau levels. The chemical potential is between Landau levels, but at the edges, the Landau levels are bent. So to say, pierce through the chemical potential. And then at these points, um, uh, they, are, uh, they give rise to chiral edge states traveling uh, along the the boundaries. So this uh, was, uh, to my understanding, uh, first observed by, by Halperin and um, Jörg and a collaborator. They developed actually a, a rather general theory, starting from minimal assumptions on the microscopic model uh, to um, uh, showing that uh, these chiral edge states uh, arise um, very generally in these, uh, these kind of systems or actually in more general systems. And then the bulk edge correspondence, which will be the topic of the rest of the talk. And I will give many more references on this. Let me just uh, mention that um, as far as I understand, the first to, to discuss this and prove this and understand this in a concrete microscopic model for non-interacting particles, namely basically in the, in the discrete Landau operator, if you like, uh, was, um, uh, Hatsugai, and at the same time, um, also again with a completely different approach, um, using so to say minimal assumptions on the microscopic limit, uh, microscopic model, and scaling uh, arguments. Um, Fröhlich and Studer uh, derived effective actions for the bulk and for the edge uh, system uh, that, implete, um, uh, in the end, also uh, showed the equality of these. Um, transport coefficients. Okay. This... Sorry, Stefan, uh, just one thing. There is yeah. a question in the chat that ah, uh, thank uh, you. from, from your Frelich, I would like to read it. Uh, so I thought that if the chemical potentials of different edge channels are different, the boundary currents will not cancel, although the system is in equilibrium. So uh, that's the uh, comment or question that you wrote on the okay. chat. Okay, so what I wanted to say here is I take the system and put it into equilibrium where the chemical potential is constant along the whole bar. So I look at equilibrium, I mean the Gibbs, the grand canonical Gibbs state with a mu, with an X independent chemical potential. Okay, so putting no, no 
uh, no external potentials, no changes in the in the. Um, and I, I think, and I always have in mind here that the material is homogeneous. Okay. If this does not answer the question, okay, you will ask again. Sounds good. Okay, good. So now this was the introduction. Now I would like to slowly start um, uh, explaining um, how, how we approach this problem. And actually, we do not start by analyzing directly the transport coefficients, but another quantity, the so-called orbital magnetization of the gas. So um, orbital magnetization means uh, magnetization means magnetic moment per volume, or in this case, per area. And orbital magnetization means the magnetic moments created by the motion of the electrons of the charged particles, not by the spins of the electrons or by the spins of the atoms. So this is really the magnetic moments created by the motion of the, the electrons. And so we would like to in, in understand the orbital magnetization of a two-dimensional Fermi gas in an external magnetic field. Okay, and for the beginning, we consider non-interacting particles. Okay, and we confine them. Okay, so here's the picture. Confine them uh, for the moment uh, to a um, area, to a square, two-dimensional square of uh, side length L. Okay, and we always consider the system in equilibrium. And as I said before, equilibrium for me means we have a homogeneous system and we don't put any uh, imbalances in chemical potentials, no external fields. Okay, really completely homogeneous system, only the constant B field. Good. And in, if you look at the classical model, we have two contributions to the magnetic moments. One given by the cyclotron orbits you all know in the constant magnetic field the classically charged particle moves on a on a, on a circle and if l is com large compared to the radius of these orbits we will have here uh, draw, draw only three but of course we will in equilibrium we will have a uniform density in the bulk of these little magnetic moments okay so we have a density of course depending on the temperature and on the chemical potential of local magnetic moments so the total magnetic moment they produce is the density times the area but then we have another contribution coming from skipping orbits running along the boundary. We put reflecting boundary conditions. And these skipping orbits, again, in equilibrium, they produce a current, an edge current, which I denote here by I transport, which is really a current where charges are transported along the boundary. And if L is large enough, the size of this current will be independent of the system size, okay? And, uh, but the magnetic moment it produces, it's just a current loop and the current loop produces a magnetic moment, which is given by the current times the enclosed area. So it's again, proportional to the area. However, if we sum up the two, two contributions, the local magnetic moments and the magnetic moment coming from the boundary current, they add up to zero. And this is actually the content of the Bohr van Leuven theorem that a classical system is thermal equilibrium will not have any uh, show any magnetization will have zero magnetic moment but in this simple example you can just check uh, that these two contributions really cancel exactly okay so this is all again just to give you an intuition about these bulk and boundary contributions to the magnetization so what happens if we now go to the to a quantum system again non-interacting particles and for the moment we just describe them using the landau hamiltonian so H infinity is now the Landau operator. So the Laplacian with a constant magnetic field on the full plane on all of R2. That's what the infinity uh, indicates. And if I write HL, I restrict the Hamiltonian again to this L by L square with Dirichlet boundary conditions. We will also use these thermodynamic potentials. So the capital F, and uh, which is the primitive of the Fermi Dirac distribution. So F prime is the Fermi Dirac distribution. Okay. And then um, we, we, will, we will, in the quantum case, we will characterize the magnetization really using thermodynamic potentials. So, uh, and uh, which I will introduce now. So by P, little p, we denote the pressure, which is the free energy per unit area by definition. So we compute the free energy of this uh, non-interacting Fermi gas per unit area. 
And uh, for the for the uh, infinite volume system, we do this by just computing the trace per unit volume of the free energy density function. Okay, they depend on inverse temperature beta, chemical potential mu, and external field B, magnetic field B. And then the magnetization is by definition the derivative of the pressure with respect to the magnetic field. In the finite system, we can actually equally well compute it just as the expectation of the angular momentum operator. I put the charge equal to one, otherwise there would be a factor E so that it becomes a magnetic moment. Uh, the expectation of the magnetic uh, uh, angular momentum operator within the thermal state, which is just given by the Fermi Dirac distribution of the corresponding Hamiltonian HL on this box. So in the finite volume, we can compute the total magnetic moment like this, divide by the area, and it will give exactly the same result uh, as if deriving the pressure with respect to B. In the infinite volume, this definition doesn't make sense anymore. So in the infinite volume, the magnetization is just defined as the derivative of the pressure with respect to the magnetic field. Okay, now, for the Landau Hamiltonian, uh, these gentlemen, Macri, Martin, and Pulé, proved that, um, first of all, these quantities here have thermodynamic limits, and that actually the thermodynamic limits really uh, satisfy this relation. I just put this as a definition, but this is not the important point. For the following, um, what I would like to stress is what they, what they showed is the form of bulk edge correspondence. They showed that the magnetization of the bulk system, so this is computed from the infinite volume Hamiltonian, equals an edge current. And this edge current is defined using the Landau operator and restricting it to the, I will look at the chat in a second, let me just finish my, finish my sentence, restricting the Landau operator to the upper half plane. So by E, I denote edge, but I always often also denote the operator restricted to the upper half plane. Okay, so that's the system with an edge at the x1 axis. So here we compute the expectation of the one component of the current operator, so the current in the direction of the edge in the thermal state. And we average this over a strip. Uh, chi h is the characteristic function of the strip, of this blue strip here, which is of width one, height h, and we take the limit h to infinity. So this is the current density average over this infinite strip. And this is actually an edge current um, because um, this limit here converges, if we take h to infinity, exponentially fast to its limiting value. So meaning the difference between this quantity and its limit um, goes exponentially to zero in, in h. So or put differently, the kernel of this operator here um, is, or the diagonal of this kernel is uh, supported exponentially close the edge. So this really corresponds to a current density flowing along the edge. And this edge current equals exactly the bulk magnetization. And this is true for all beta, for all mu, and for all b. So this is a bulk edge duality, which is an identity, which is independent of mu being in a spectral gap or of zero temperature. Okay, now I should look at the chat. Sorry, there was a question. Ah, spin not playing a role here. Yes, the, I deliberately leave spin out of the game because I'm really interested only in the orbital magnetization. If we would add spin, everything was, would mix up. So the idea here is to really look at, uh, at the magnetization coming from the transport of charges, not from the spins. Okay. Uh, oh no. This. Okay. Sorry, Stefan. I have yeah. another question. Uh, so this is a really a positive temperature result, or, or can you also? Um, you know, this can, can you... this is an identity which holds for all beta. So in particular, it also holds in the limit beta to infinity. But the limit is taken after the limit h goes to infinity, or on the right hand side. Mm. Um, Yes, I mean, so to say, this is the definition of this quantity. And um, you can do this for every beta, that's the statement. Okay. For every, 
finite beta. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's an identity, and um, of course you will see quantization. Okay, no, this is not yet about transport coefficient, not about uh, uh, um, quantization yet. But I will come to this. Okay, so this is the result uh, they prove, and uh, I would now again. I mean, this is now heuristics explain to you what this tells us about this this picture I showed you in the beginning. So first of all, in the in the case of the Landau operator, it turns out that the total magnetic moment, so this magnetization density m infinity, is actually different from zero. So meaning that if you compute the magnetic moment of a finite sample using the density times the area, we get really a non-zero magnetization. That's what's called Landau diamagnetism, uh, usually. OK, and the next question I would like to ask here, because it also becomes relevant for our discussion later on, is can we also, in this case, distinguish bulk and boundary contributions to the total magnetic moment in a finite sample? OK. And the answer is yet yes for the Landau Hamiltonian one can compute the magnetization of the infinite volume system explicitly and separate it in two parts. The first part is just uh, this quantity here n plus one half times v over two pi is just the magnetic moment of an eigenstate in the nth Landau uh, level okay. Um, and here we just sum up with the density given by the Fermi Dirac distribution, the contribution from the localized states in the bands in the bands. So that would be the contribution to what we called M log before. And the rest is what we'll call the residual magnetization, which cannot be associated to local current, uh, to local currents. And um, so what we find, is that the magnetic moment of a large sample, the total magnetic moment is um, the uh, magnetization times the area, the magnetization we can split into these two parts. But now the, um, the theorem I just showed you of these uh, uh, guys uh, tells us that the magnetization in the bulk equals the current flowing along the edge of the sample, okay? And uh, now, actually, this edge current, we can also split into two parts. And uh, that is uh, in a magnetization current and a transport current. Why is this? Um, what, is, what is a magnetization current? If you have, uh, if you have a, so to say, an, 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 um, a solid with a position-dependent density of magnetic moments, then the curl of this position dependent density of uh, magnetic moments is, gives, uh, it gives rise to a current density that is so-called magnetization current density. So if the magnetization is position dependent in a solid or in a, in a medium, it gives rise to a magnet so-called magnetization current. And in our case, if we restrict the homogeneous sample to a finite uh, homogeneous medium to a finite uh, area at the boundary, so for example, if we look at this half infinite uh, plane, then at uh, x2 equals zero, the magnetization density will drop or in the vicinity will drop from its bulk value m log to zero. Okay, and no matter how exactly this, this drop of the magnetization density uh, happens, if we integrate the curl of this function, I'm not going through this computation, we find that in two dimensions, if whenever we have a homogeneous medium with a homogeneous magnetization density in the bulk, the magnetization current at the edge will be equal to this um, magnetization density. So actually, um, this general argument uh, okay, it's of course heuristics, if you like, uh, tells you that um, we have we expect that whenever a homogeneous magnetization terminates, there must be an associated edge current, a magnetization current, and in two D, it's really equal to the to m log. But having this equality, this implies in particular that also the transport current along the edge, which is all the rest, is um, equals the residual magnetization. So if we believe this heuristics, then this theorem here 
implies also that the residual magnetization equals the transport current. And this basically tells us that this picture we had in the beginning is, is consistent, that we can write the total magnetic moment of such a sample as a sum of two contributions, the local magnetic moments in the bulk times the area or the density of magnetic moments in the bulk times the area plus a transport current going along the edges times the enclosed area. Okay, so basically this theorem tells us that uh, that um, this picture we had in the in the classical case can be also made consistent in the in the quantum case in particular at least for the for the lambda operator okay so this is now the okay this is a form of bulk edge duality which might appear after this discussion almost trivial but there is actually something to prove in microscopic models here and now I would like relate this to transport coefficients. That's what we are actually after. Okay, and again, we still do it for the lambda operator. So the edge conductance um, is usually defined um, as the linear response of the current. And we are now really talking about the transport current, not the magnetic current, with respect to a change in the chemical potential. That's the definition of the edge conductance. And that's the usual definition with one caveat I will talk about later. And the definition of the whole conductivity in the bulk, you usually define it using linear response. If you accept this definition, you can actually prove for the lambda operator that at any temperature and any chemical potential mu, the transport coefficient you get from linear response equals the mu derivative of the magnet uh, of the residual magnetization. So this was, for example, shown by, by, by Horia, Georg, and Peterson. Um, but if we put all of this together, if we believe this uh, heuristics about the uh, um, magnetization current, then uh, this implies that we have a bulk edge correspondence for the transport coefficients. So these objects here agree due to the previous theorem. So they agree. So we have bike edge correspondence for transport coefficients at any temperature and any, any chemical potential. And uh, all of what I said until now were basically known results, but I didn't, so to say, see this, uh, this um, conclusion from these results uh, before. So um, I think it's an interesting observation to see that this, at least in, uh, in, in this very simple type of system, Equality of, of transport coefficients is completely independent from quantization at zero temperature and from spectral or mobility gaps. So this really holds uh, generally. And it's a consequence of, um, of this uh, picture of magnetization and edge currents. Okay, good. So the first result I would like to show is basically a generalization of this equality here uh, to non-interacting particles described by random ergodic uh, Schrödinger operators. So let me be a bit quick on this, since I would like to spend also some time talking about the interacting case. So for, for the theorem, what we assume is that we, uh, we have again um, Hamiltonian for the bulk on the infinite volume, which is just now again the lambda operator, but we now add periodic vector and periodic, uh, possibly periodic uh, um, scalar potential A and D and also um, possibly an um, ergodic random potential, the omega. So we assume that all these potentials are smooth functions and the random potential is just, uh, you put, uh, you have here IID random variables, omega gamma, and at each lattice side, you put a uh, compactly supported bump function, smooth bump function U with, uh, with the strength omega gamma. So that's the, that's the bulk Hamiltonian. And uh, the edge Hamiltonian is just the restriction of the bulk Hamiltonian again to the upper half plane. So we have again uh, edge at the x1 axis. But actually, we're also allowed to put an additional perturbation, or uh, not perturbation, uh, additional smooth random or periodic potential that is supported in a finite strip uh, uh, along the edge. 
okay? And that does not have to be small. So the idea is at the edge, we can perturb the system um, by, by whatever we like here, by some, okay, in this case, by a potential. Good, and then the theorem reads as before, as the result by uh, Macri, Martin, Poulet, namely that the magnetization computed from the thermodynamic potentials now of this bulk operator equals the edge current computed as before from the, uh, uh, so to say, the, the, the edge current in the uh, thermal state of the edge Hamiltonian. Okay, and actually the same holds for the new derivatives of the quantities. So we show that they are differentiable with respect to mu and this equality extends. This will be important for, um, for uh, relating to transport coefficients. And again, this is true in the, for any temperature and independent of mu being in a gap or spectral gap in the bulk. In order to relate this result now uh, to transport coefficients, at the moment, we can do this only in the usual setting, namely when we assume that the chemical potential is in a spectral gap of the bulk Hamiltonian. And when we take the temperature zero limit. So the statement is if we take the temperature zero limit of the left hand side and have this condition being in a bulk uh, gap with mu, then uh, the limit here is by just exchanging second derivatives, it's the B derivative of the density. So this equality is simple, but uh, the B derivative of the density equals the zero temperature whole conductivity in the bulk. This is usually called Streda's formula, but there's really something to prove. And this was proved only recently in this paper for this kind of setting. So that it's known that under this condition, the left-hand side at zero temperature equals the whole conductance, the whole conductivity. And thus we see that um, the, uh, yeah, if we take the limit beta to infinity on the left-hand side, we can also take it on the, on the right-hand side. And uh, this limit is by definition, the edge conductance at zero temperature. Where I should, uh, so to say one short remark, I put here tilde because before I defined the edge conductance as the derivative of the transport current with respect to mu. But actually this here is the usual definition. People compute the edge current and take a derivative with respect to mu. The point is that in this case here, where mu is in the spectral gap of the bulk, the density of magnetic moments in the bulk does not depend on mu locally. If I change mu, there will be no change of the density of magnetic moments. So the, the, the magnetic edge current will be mu independent. So this derivative will actually be also equal to the derivative of the transport current at the edge. So it really gives the correct uh, edge conductance. Okay. So basically these arguments together give a uh, different proof of a known result, namely that um, in such system under these conditions at zero temperature, the uh, transport coefficients in the bulk and at the edge agree. Okay. However, if we could prove this result here, also for mu in a mobility gap, if you could relate uh, the could proof of strata formula also with mu in a mobility gap, Actually, we could use our result to extend um, this, uh, um, this claim of equality of transport coefficients also to, to systems with a mobility gap in the bike, and that would be a new result. Okay, good. Before briefly commenting on the proof and then going to the interacting setting, let me just uh, mention a few, um, few results from the from the uh, mathematical physics literature at t equals zero that, uh, that deal with uh, microscopic models. So there's again a question in the chat now. Okay, so if you, uh, maybe it's easier if you, if you just turn on your micro and ask questions. For me, it's not easy to follow the chat here. It was not a question, no worries. Okay, worry. okay. good. Um, so for such non-interacting models I was talking about until now, the 
okay, there are, there are several results. So uh, Schulz Baldes, K and Richter, they proved it for a discrete model with mu in a in a spectral gap. Elbow and Graf, they um, gave a different proof, maybe a more elementary proof, simpler proof, and slightly more general result for the for uh, basically for the same setting. Ken Dong Schulz Baldes uh, generalized this to random Schrödinger operators, exactly the setting I showed you now. Basically, we, we reproduce their result. And then actually, um, Elgard Graf and Schenker, they show this also for um, disc, uh, discrete or so tight binding models with mu in a mobility gap. And this is the first time, as far as I know, where it has been observed that in that case, actually, the definition of the edge conductance has to be modified. So you have to take into account that the total current you compute in this way does not necessarily agree with the, with the transport current. So that there's a con contribution coming from the change of the magnetization density. So they uh, have to subtract here the contribution coming from the mag magnetization current, which if mu is in a mobility gap, if you change mu in the bulk, you will populate or depopulate localized states which contribute to the magnetization. So the magnetization density in the bulk will change if you change mu. This will change the magnetization current at the edge, and this you have to compensate here. So they formulate this quite differently, but that's basically exactly what, uh, what they do, what I also proposed here to do. OK. And for interacting systems, as I said, starting from a, analyzing a microscopic model, um, as far as I know, there are only the results by, by Alessandro Giuliani, Vieri, Marcello, and uh, Giovanni Antinucci, in different com uh, uh, combinations, where they basically prove that the equality at zero temperature of transport coefficients uh, and their, their quantization are stable against introducing weak interactions between the particles. So you start with a system of non-interacting particles where you have bulk edge correspondence and quantization of transport coefficients. And then you show that neither the bulk transport coefficient nor the edge transport coefficients in the lower two papers change if you add weak interactions among the particles. Okay, good. And um, okay, is this a question? Uh, yes, there is a question. Uh, it's Jurg uh, asking uh, uh, or commenting, I thought that we had proven such a thing in the 90s. Okay, I mean, that's what I tried to mention in the beginning. Um, this, or, this is why I said here, I, I focus on, uh, on, on works that really analyze a concrete microscopic model. And um, if I understand it correctly, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, what what is in the paper with uh, with uh, Studa, for example, is making assumptions about the microscopic model and then deriving from this using these uh, scaling limits effective actions for the bulk and the edge system, and from that it then follows uh, uh, this equality follows, but it's not starting with uh, with uh, hands on microscopic models and computing everything in the microscopic model. Okay, I'm, of course, you could say this, this argument in the end is much more general and uh, makes it superfluous to study microscopic models. Um, but for the moment, I would like to take the, take the, okay, I have to take the point of view because that's what we did, that we want to study this in concrete microscopic models uh, and not via the way of uh, scaling arguments and um, scaling limits and effective actions. Good, so before I go to the interacting case, let me very briefly give you the strategy of proof of this equality of magnetization in the bulk and edge current because the proof is, if you forget about all the technicalities, very simple. So what we want to do is we want to relate um, a bulk quantity to an edge quantity. And the first step is to do this for the pressure. So the, the pressure in the bulk is just the average uh, free energy per unit area, which we can compute in, 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 different, in different ways. And the, the first observation is if you compute the average free energy of the edge system in an infinite strap 
strip starting at the boundary, then these averages will agree because, okay, assuming, and this is what has to show in this case, it's easy to show that the free energy of the two system with and without edge approaches the same value once in the edge system, we go away from the edge. So we go into the bulk. So the, the density of free energy might be different at the edge, but in the bulk, it doesn't see the edge. And therefore, if I average this free energy density of an infinite strip going infinitely into the bulk, whatever happens here at the boundary cannot change this uh, infinite volume limit. Okay, averaging a function which becomes constant if you approach infinity, you don't see what happens in the beginning. You don't see what happens at the edge. So basically proving this equality is rather straightforward using that in the bulk away from the edge, these two operators are close by, or actually the operator kernels are very, uh, uh, are very close. Then the technically more demanding step is to prove that this is also true for the B derivatives of these quantities. Why? Because uh, changing the B field for an Hamiltonian on infinite space is a very sing singular perturbation. It changes the domain, so you have to be rather careful in computing these derivatives. Okay, so that is basically first step, relate bulk and edge via densities and using that in the, in the bulk, also the edge system has, has the same density. Okay, in the end, this follows, of course, from the ellipticity of this, uh, this operator. Good, and then the next step is to relate this quantity here to, the, um, to this edge current. And again, basically we, we use homogeneity in the bulk by observing that if I now formally, uh, this is the, the, the quantity we have to compute, the B derivative of this trace here. If I just do the derivative formally, what I get, I have to, the, the B only appears in the Hamiltonian. I get an F prime, that's the Fermi Dirac distribution times the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to B but this just gives me the momentum operator and the one direction in the gauge we chose. So I basically already get the edge current. However, a priori it could be that this current is supported everywhere in this strip. However, one can show, and this is also well known, that in the bulk of such a homogeneous systems, there cannot be persistent currents at equilibrium. So actually that's not the right picture. When there are currents, they have to be near the edge. And so this gives the edge current. So it's a, if you if you forget about technicalities, it's a simple computation to relate the bulk magnetization to the edge current. And this strategy actually can now be um, also applied to to interacting systems. So why are we interested in in, in interacting systems? Um, okay, first the question is does the this equality extend beyond weakly interacting systems if we agree to focus now on, on microscopic models. Um, the next thing is, of course, um, actually screening effects near the boundary due to the long range Coulomb repulsion are extremely important if you want to really understand the location of whole currents or the distribution of whole currents in experiments and explicit samples. Uh, this comes with the, with the keyword of formation of incompressible stripes. This is something which is usually completely ignored in the, in the mathematical literature. And this is something we will also ignore because we cannot treat long range Coulomb interactions. However, we could effectively incorporate this by effective potentials near the, the edge. And I forgot to emphasize in this result here that Again, it's all temperatures, all chemical potentials, but it's also, um, uh, so to say here, we also allowed for arbitrary perturbations near the edge. So we see that this edge current is insensitive to perturbations near the edge, the quantity, because this does, uh, is equal to a quantity which is given by the bulk Hamiltonian, and this doesn't know about our edge perturbation W at all. So however we perturb at the edge, we will always get the same edge current. So this edge currents are stable against perturbations at the edge. Okay, and uh, the, the, the last thing why we would like to have interactions is 
because in fractional quantum whole systems, it is known they cannot be small perturbations of non-interacting systems because they are the spectral gap above the grounds that is created by the interactions. So to understand fractional quantum Hall effects, one has to go beyond perturbing non-interacting systems. Okay, so let me last use the last minutes to, to briefly explain the, the corresponding result we get for interacting systems. And now we look at uh, type binding models. So we look at uh, yeah, fermions, interacting fermions on uh, finite lattices. Now, actually, the, it's 2L plus 1 by 2L plus 1. Uh, so this is our domain lambda in the lattice set 2. The one particle Hilbert space is just the L2 space over this configuration space lambda. And we can put a finite dimensional on-site Hilbert space to model additional degrees of freedom on non-trivial lattice cells. Uh, the corresponding n particle Hamiltonian is the anti-symmetric uh, tensor product. And, and we're looking at the fermionic Fox space over such a domain, which is still a finite dimensional space. The um, observable, uh, the algebra of uh, bounded operators on the corresponding Fox space over region X here is the finite region X is denoted by AX. And the local algebra is just the union or the inductive limit of all these um, local algebras. Okay, if you don't know this, I will not have time to explain it, but I'm pretty sure that uh, looking at the names, most of you are familiar with this language. Okay, so what kind of Hamiltonian would we like to look at? So we would like to again define, uh, consider a gas of fermions now interacting. And um, so the Hamiltonian will be of the form that we have a hopping term, so a non, uh, so to say, non-interacting uh, uh, term here describing the, the the kinetic energy of the of the particles, which is of the form that we have a translation invariant hopping. And the B field, the magnetic field, only enters through a pile space. So that's the only part where the B field enters. So we only want to have the coupling of the B field to the motion of the particles. And then we allow for a uh, finite range translation in invariant interaction phi infinity. Think about the finite range density density interaction between the particles, for example. And then we are also allowed to put additional interactions in a finite strip at the boundary of lambda and uh, think of an external potential at the boundary or defects or whatever, or maybe changing the density density interaction near the boundary. Okay, um, apart from what I said, an important assumption is that these two contributions to the Hamiltonian commute with the X1 operator, meaning they don't contribute to currents. Okay, this is the case, for example, if we have density density interactions and external potentials. Okay, that's the type of Hamiltonian we look at. And now we define the magnetization and the currents exactly as before. So the, 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 the Gibbs state is, or the grand canonical Gibbs state is the exponential of H minus mu times the number operator divided by the partition function. The grand canonical pressure is the logarithm of the partition function multiplied by the temperature and divided by the area. And the magnetization is again defined as the derivative of the pressure with respect to B. Okay, good. The, in this case, the current operator, which is by definition the uh, commutator of the uh, one, comp or the one component of the current operator is the one component of X commutator with the Hamiltonian. And since um, everything but the, but the hoppings commute with X1, we only get the contribution from the hoppings. And since we have only nearest neighbor hoppings, we get here a sum of currents between um, horizontally neighboring sides. And now we define the boundary current and we have to take some of the edges at the lower edge by summing up the hoppings or the currents starting at x10 going to, uh, uh, um, okay, maybe I should immediately show the picture. So we sum up here all the uh, hoppings over uh, from sides with x1 equal to zero to x1 equal to one. 
so the green arrows here, and the first L1 at the lower boundary. Okay, so little L should be small compared to capital L. So this will be the current going through this fiducial line, uh, which I drew, drew in red here. And we take the expectation in the thermal Gibbs state. That's the, the boundary current. And it depends on little L, of course, at the moment. So, and what, uh, okay, and now uh, we have to make an additional assumption, which we cannot prove in general. I will say more about this in a second. And as I told you, the strategy of proof uses that in the bark far away from the boundary, the Gibbs state of the system does not see the boundary anymore. So that we have a, in the bark a homogeneous system. So what we, what we assume is that our Gibbs state, um, or we define first and then we assume this, uh, satisfies fast, what, we, what I call here fast convergence in the bark meaning that there's an infinite volume state rho infinity on the quasi local algebra of the infinite system, such that if I look at an observable A supported in some finite side X, that's the red set here, then the expectation in the finite volume Gibbs state on lambda compared to the expectation of the infinite volume state rho infinity, this different goes exponentially fast to zero in the distance of x to the boundary. So that basically means if I sit in the bark and then push the boundary away, I will converge very quickly to, uh, to, to the expectations I expect in the bulk Gibbs state. Okay, that's a very strong assumption where it's not easy to prove in general. And actually for the kind of general systems I was speaking here about, I only know um, one result, uh, one way to show it, and this was done, for example, in this paper by, by Klisch and al, namely uh, to assume that the temperature is sufficiently high. So they prove that below a critical beta star, actually, this holds true uh, uniformly in B and mu. So for sufficiently high temperature, this is true locality of the Gibbs state in this sense, in general, we don't know, but we would expect this for quantum hole systems that they are homogeneous in the bulk and that there's no uh, phase transition in the bulk. Okay, and now the theorem, and I'm almost finished, is that uh, um, under the assumption that we, the Gibbs states behaves in the right way at a given temperature beta, at a given mu and B, then the difference between the bulk magnetization and this is using this, uh, this assumption, um, of course, on the Gibbs state allows me easily to do a thermodynamic limit on the magnetization. It's very simple. So the thermodynamic limit of the magnetization exists. I denote it again by M infinity equals the edge current. And for this, I don't do a thermodynamic limit. I look at this on a, on a finite uh, box lambda, but this difference um, goes to zero when I take the size of the box large and the size of the strip, the little l also large. Okay, so we have here basically in the limit where capital L goes to infinity faster than little l, um, this converges to zero. So we get again an equality between bulk magnetization and edge current. And the same holds true for the mu derivatives. Okay, good. So um, I will not speak about the proof here. Basically, the proof strategy is the same as before. The only thing we always use is that in the bulk, the Gibbs of the edge system, the Gibbs state of the edge system looks like the Gibbs state of the bulk system, of the system without any edges. Okay, so let me conclude with saying, we, we cannot prove anything about transport coefficients for interacting systems yet. There has been recent progress on computing transport coefficients in the bulk um, due to uh, uh, Sven Bachmann, Wojciech de Röck, and Martin Fraas, who proved the adiabatic theorem for, uh, for gap systems, but this is all at zero temperature. Actually, we extended this a little bit, and particularly we can also deal with systems uh, we have here, where actually the Hamiltonians will not have a spectral gap because of edge states. 
but still you can understand transport coefficients here for large volumes in the bulk at zero temperature if you have a gap in the bulk. So this is well understood, transport coefficients at zero temperature. However, um, we cannot yet prove this bulk edge duality for the magnetization and the edge current at zero temperature. So we cannot um, relate, for example, d mu m to the uh, transport coefficients, uh, which are known at zero temperature. And actually also this, uh, what I said before, what we also use the Streda formula, namely that we can use, uh, relate the zero temperature hole conductivity in the bulk to the derivative of the magnetization. This is also, as far as I know, has not been shown for interacting systems. Okay, but I think these are actually problems one, one can work on and that should be um, doable. Okay. With this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you, Stefan, for the um, very nice talk. I now um, open the discussion uh, and in particular leave room for questions. So actually, maybe maybe I can start. Uh, um, I, sorry, could you comment again on the first item of the still missing? Uh, I didn't. Uh, so what, what I didn't quite understand. What? Um... So we would like to prove also for these interacting systems equality of bulk and edge conductance, mm -hmm. and um, at zero temperature. Mm -hmm. or maybe at any temperature that could be a long-term goal so i mean okay i didn't emphasize this for the for the lander operator we saw that it holds at any temperature so it might be a conjecture that this is always true that these that these transport coefficients have to agree at all temperatures no matter what however the point is why we cannot do this at for other systems than the than the uh, lander operator at the moment is because we don't even know how to compute the transport coefficients in the bulk at positive temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay, in particular, these, these, uh, these uh, works on computing transport coefficients using linear response for interacting systems in the bulk are really at zero temperature. Ah, they use okay. the adiabatic theory. Ah, sorry, yes. So at positive okay. temperature, you have to really come up with new ideas. I see. So yes. we, we have the equality here at positive temperature at the moment, but we understand transport coefficients only at zero temperature. All right, so thank still you. Still missing means we would like to, and this is, I think, the easiest thing to do is to extend this here to zero temperature, at least for systems which have a bulk, a bulk gap at zero temperature, because I believe, or we, everybody believes that in this case, um, this locality of the Gibbs state, what I, what I, or this fast conversions of the ground state in that case still holds true, because if you assume a gap, the um, the the Gibbs state should be, in the bulk should not see the edge. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. Yes, now it's clear. Thank you. Uh, I see a, a raised hand uh, from Jurga. So. Yes. How much is known uh, from you know this very uh, mathematical point of view about the validity of the formula that sigma infinity is equal to d the derivative of the current with respect to the electric field that I apply in the bulk. Um, I mean, if this. You know, if this can be proven, then the rest is sort of uh, totally general arguments. Um, so the, we're now talking about the conductivity in the bulk. Yes. Okay. But it has um, implications there, for the you can, uh, there you can show at, at zero temperature. That's basically the, the content um, of the way we do it. You apply a small electric field across yes. the sample. So, um, and that, of course, if you make the sample large, that will close the spectral gap. Necessarily, yeah, you know, course. okay. But you can right. adiabatically turn on such a, such a field. And then the current response um, can, be, can be computed and actually related to a formula for which these people I showed in the beginning, like Hastings Michalakis, and also these gentlemen here prove that it's quantized. 
So at zero temperature, no, you I don't can... even want to know whether it's quantized. I just want to know whether the whole law is a law from the point of view of mathematics. Um, okay, then I'm not sure if, okay, I, I let me try to say again, what if this is Hall's law, you compute the current density as a function of the applied electric field. Yes. Yes. And you can prove that at least, I mean, you, you, you can, you can show that this is well defined and that, uh, that yeah, you, you get a quantity. And uh, this, um, okay, I, I mean, I mean not, I'm not sure. I mean, you can compute this explicitly in the way I just said, this uh, response coefficient, and you get an expression for it and that you have to analyze. So, uh, I mean, what, you, what you're saying is, I mean, that's the definition that the transport coefficient for me is by definition, the response of the current to an electric field. Yes. This I would like to, to compute. And I would like to show that actually, if I adiabatically turn on the uh, electric field, my system goes into a stationary state, which carries the current. And this current is proportional to the applied electric field. Yes. And this factor I call the sigma infinity. Right. So, but then the, the the fact that this bulk conductivity is equal to the edge conductivity is a general consequence. That has been, you know, well known for some time. So, a little okay. confused about. Um, okay, so. I'm not sure. Okay, the, the, you could say that what I showed you is there anything to prove when you prove m equal i, or is this a general concept? No, no, I don't prove m equals i. I just want to know whether i equals sigma infinity times e. If that is a fact, I mean, there can be corrections, but if the leading law is i equals sigma infinity times e then the equality sigma infinity equals sigma h is a general consequence. But um, I'm, this equality is the definition, right, of sigma infinity. No, it's not the definition because the connection between i and e need not be linear. It's, you know, a sort of profound fact that it is linear up to possibly further corrections that are unimportant for the proof of equality between bulk and edge conductivity. Okay, good. But okay, but then this is proven that there is a non-vanishing linear term in this relation. Right. But then everything else is general arguments. You see, that's what uh, sort of puzzles me about the many discussions that I've heard, including this one. I mean, it was a very nice talk, but this aspect puzzles me and I'm not quite sure about why people, yeah. Okay, I, I think, uh, I, I, okay, to some extent, I completely see, see your point, but somehow the, I, or maybe that's, uh, that's the difficult thing to show here, which we did not show in the interacting systems, is to show that, I mean, the, this general arguments, you have to assume that also the bulk and the edges decouple because of course the, 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 the response and the bulk could be very different if there are, if there are edges or if there are no edges. So um, it's, maybe. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in a way, I mean, it's okay. Maybe it's, a, it's just a mathematical physics problem to check if these general arguments really can be it can be uh, confirmed by using uh, by by analyzing microscopic mm -hmm. models and um, mm -hmm. yeah i'm okay. i don't know maybe one of the colleagues would like to add to this right. uh, um okay otherwise um I'm not sure. But we can probably also postpone the discussion to the, you know, non-recorder part. It's also okay. Okay. Um, other questions from the audience? 
Uh, yes, please, uh, Professor Atsugai. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, we don't hear you. Uh, do you have a comment on the uh, rhythm straight formula? Um, yes, so I could tell you a long are story about mathematical way to justify the rhythm straight up type formula. Um, the work yeah. is for using the thermodynamic function, right? Yeah. And that can be applied for all temperature also. Yeah. And the, uh, so what you are talking about is quite similar to the, uh, their argument. Isn't it true? So um, now, I'd like to say that the, uh, how do you separate the, the uh, effect of the boundary from bulk? You have some uh, the expression using a thermodynamic quantity, but the, I feel that without using the uh, gap, uh, it's very hard to separate from bulk and edges. So, so how do you separate the the uh, effect of the boundary and bulk for all temperature? That's quite unclear for me. Okay, I mean, this uh, several questions. Let me try a short answer first. So, um, actually, the the Widem Strader formula. They are different. Okay, if you look at the literature, this confused us for quite some time because mm -hmm. you find uh, in the history, it changes over time. So in the beginning, the, the, the Strader formula was basically, uh, and also in the paper of Widem, in this famous yeah. uh, two line paper, it was <laughs> yes. basically this formula here. And the claim uh -huh. was it holds at all temperatures and at all chemical potential, but this is wrong. This holds here yeah. only because of the gap in the bulk and uh, because of zero temperature. In general, the formula like it's written in the paper of Widem is plainly wrong for positive temperatures because it does not take into account that the magnetization um, basically is composed of two parts, local magnetic moments and uh, this residual magnetization. So actually in the beginning, I have to admit, there's a version of the paper on the archive which we have to replace. We thought that if we take the Widem formula series, this equality proves bulk edge duality for transport coefficients at all temperatures. We were very happy to prove this. And then we realized that the Widem formula is actually not true in general. And there are several papers of Slater and co-workers, I mean, dating until five years ago or so, where they, where they discuss this, that, uh, that you have to be very careful when relating density to transport coefficients at positive temperatures. So this is, one answer, yeah. and in this specific case, it has been proved for these models. And then the question how I relate um, bulk and boundary yeah. for, the, for the transport coefficients, yeah, we can do it only either for the Landau operator, then it holds very generally, or, um, or at zero temperature in this case. But if we look at the bulk boundary correspondence for the magnetization and the edge current, then basically, mm -hmm. The, the strategy is, as I tried to explain, I mean, we, we just by direct computation, you find that this, this equal, okay, I mean, I've, we use, so to say, homogeneity in the bulk. I mean, the idea is here that uh, a priori, just by computing the magnetization and doing, um, yeah, you would, you would find that it's equal to a current which could extend into the bulk. Uh -huh. But then you realize that if the system is homogeneous in the bulk, and that's what we, what we always assume in the interacting case, I assume that it's periodic. Here we assume that it uh, has an ergodic random or can have also an ergodic uh, random part, but it's still homogeneous in the bulk uh, that for this, for, because of the homogeneity, there can be no persistent currents in the bulk. And therefore, actually, this quantity has to be supported near the edge. So basically, by excluding that there's a contribution in the bulk, we conclude that it's the current at the edge. Okay. Uh -huh. I understand. Okay. Other questions, comments? It 
does not seem to be the case. So uh, let's thank again, uh, Stefan, for this very nice talk. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you all for listening.